Here we go. And go. Hey, everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog. And that hey. was the lovely Laura Morgan. <laughs> I had to turn off my fan. <laughs> Slap. Camera's on. Ah, I'm out of here. Uh, and this is the lovely Laura Morgan, still recovering from her illness. Um, I have to say, like, not to steal her thunder, but I'm in the same boat. I think she's more, a little more sick than me, but uh, I got the same the same thing. And we were informed by uh, Ladon, who I think is an Oregon resident, who was talking about that I guess it's a pretty common fungal, it sounds terrible, fungal thing that comes from the trees, <clears throat> like a mold, a mold that comes from the trees. And, uh, Weird. And creates, creates a lot of this stuff. So at least you got a diagnosis, right? Hey, I'll take anything I can get. All right, that, that's, that's half, the, half the battle. So uh, anyways, guys, uh, good to be back. We've got lots of exciting, cool, awesome news going on. Um, besides us being mutually ill, we've got uh, final stage is the DVD production, and you guys are like, "Yeah, you said that every single episode, buddy." But we're really in the final final stages. We got some major like closeness going on. Um, Laura's flying out on Sunday, and uh, that's mainly to help me work through the VO stuff, uh, voiceover. Uh, for those folks who don't know what that means. Um, so we've got uh, all the voiceover stuff with the DVD, which is like a whole process in and of itself, right? So you've got like me talking on the DVD, you've got like all the pop-ups and graphics, and then you've also got me like narrating stuff, um, you know, from, from a voiceover standpoint. So it's another kind of aspect of it. And it's like, if you don't think about it, you're like, okay, well, we're done shooting, except there's a million more processes to get through. Uh, so we'll be doing that. It's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm really happy that Laura's come down to hold my hand through it. It can be a little nerve wracking getting through the process. She's also going to help me work with some clients. She's going to yawn a little bit, sleep a little bit. I bet she'll get like a ben, little some beignets, a little beignets, a little bit. I sound like Jeff Gelman, some beignets. Yeah. And hey, you guys going to get some beignets? And um, uh, what else? And I, I think we're going to try and shoot some some NOLA footage for uh, for uh, for the intro video for that's going to be our new NOLA intro video for the website here. NOLA could be splitting time back and forth, and so we got to be pimped out, making sure everything is looking rocking and rolling for you guys. Anyways, I think let's see. I think I covered all the juicy bits. Yeah. That means it's time for us to jump into. The show. Laura Morgan, are you ready to jump? You thought you'd get away easy, didn't you? Ah, uh-oh. What does this mean? Which dance is that? Does that have a name? Is, is that is that called the uh, the flipped over turtle, the <laughs> struggling turtle? <laughs> I've decided to embrace my inner dancer ever uh -huh. since that Drake music video. I'm yeah. just like you just pulled it all I'm out. A <laughs> like I watch him and I'm like, I am a dancer. There's no doubt. <laughs> Well, I think you just proved that sufficiently just now. So I think it's no longer up for debate that you are officially a dancer. And maybe you could <laughs> go a whole other career if you were so inclined. So I, I like to send this video off to like Dancing with the Stars and see, see what they think about it. We've got some connections there. So uh, that, I'd love that said, Hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog, and this is The Good Dog's Q&A Saturday, episode number 54. 54. 54. It's jamming. We're, we're moving along. We're over the year mark, which is like amazing. And um, this is the lovely Laura Morgan, as I mentioned, uh, the recovering lovely Laura Morgan, and um, all this good stuff 
that you always see is the Good Dogs Q and A Saturday, and we're gonna jump on in. And I think <clears throat> this might be the last one that we do this uh, this this format yeah. because you're here. I think we're gonna jump in and try and record one early uh, with you here, so um, we can get into some of our old action and our old dynamics, yep. and then. And then I think I might be home by the time for the next one. I'm not sure. Oh, I have really? to okay. Yeah. So it's like I'm my my journey, my never ending journey here is coming coming to a close. Close. Coming to a close, unfortunately. So are you ready to uh, are you ready to jump into a little ready. bit? Do you ready. have anything you want to share before we jump in? No, I just this trip was a little last minute, and you know, getting all the logistics ready and getting. I kept ordering. Oh. I guess I should put the camera on me. I kept ordering tickets and they yeah. kept like, I get all the way through the end of the process and then they'd be like, this fair is not available anymore. And uh. I have to start over. I'm like, wouldn't you just tell me in the middle, like just say, Hey, do you still want to pay for this ticket? Even though it's at this, you know, but yeah. I did it like five times. And then I went to a different site, but then that different site didn't have, this is like trick of the trade stuff guys. I went to Orbitz and then I went to American Express Travel because I was sick of Orbitz shenanigans. Yeah. And then American Express Travel didn't have um, the premium seats. You know, I'm almost six foot tall, so I have to get the leg room. So I, I, they didn't have the, um, the, the premium seats even available. So I had to go back to Orbitz and go through this nonsense again and like wow. hold on. And then they finally... I, I had to pick a different type, different ticket, like uh, after trying 10 times, but I'm all set. You good? You're all set? You got, you oh. pulled the trigger. Yep, pulled the trigger and I have leg room. So, uh, I'm good. well, that's a good combo. I'm so excited that you're coming down. It's going to be fun. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's gonna be great. We got some work to do, but I'm sure we'll squeeze in a little fun bike rides yeah. and some, some fun stuff like that. So, that's Ooh. always, always awesome. So, yeah. cool. So, let's jump. Um, okay. We've got a question number one from Amy, so yep. you want to jump on in? Amy says, question number one. That's Amy. Amy says, hey guys, Amy here. Three weeks ago I considered throwing in the towel with our one-year-old Dachshund, Dachshund Beagle Rescue named Mickey. We adopted him last October. Um, it's been a long year. He's anxious, whiny, leash pulls, barking at people, dog reactive with barking and lunging. Um, thankfully, at my breaking point, I found your website and YouTube channel and encouraged me to stay the course. Aw. Yeah. After changing the prong collar, pulling has stopped, reactivity has changed. He's mastered the quiet street, and I'm now braving my anxiety and taking him into our downtown area. Now when we approach a person or dog, he'll stop, avoid, and fearfully whine. Do I put him in a sit and correct the whine and whatever arises, or do I continue to move forward and insist he continue in a heel? I've watched lots of videos from the YouTube channel. You guys make it look so easy. When you started, what were some of your learning curves? <laughs> Sorry, I slipped into another question. Um, and then she also asked, do you know any balanced dog trainers on Long Island? Thanks so much for your work making all the difference and making it. Ah. Yep. I love that tune. Uh, <laughs> you guys know that that's me, right? Me and my my me and my buddies with all those yeah. songs. Those are those are original compositions played by uh, me and my friends. Um, yeah. Anyways, so enough about me, Amy. Awesome stuff. That's so cool that you that you're managing to like. You know, hang in there even with stuff going on that's that's pretty challenging. Sounds like you really had your hands full there. Um, I think you went to a prong collar and, and started to really see some, some major differences with the walk and, and the what you were calling aggression is now looking to be like more reactivity and worry and concern and all that. So that's a nice change. You know, it's not our finish line. It's a nice change. So um, as for an approaching people, um, or dogs or anything like that. Our first plan of attack is always space. So we never like expect a dog, especially a nervous, reactive, aggressive, aggressive dog, anything like that. We never expect them to be able to like thread the needle and be right next to another dog without explosion. It's just too much pressure, especially initially. So you need to be making you need to be making sure that you're using space as an ally to to keep the stress level and keep the pressure level at a manageable place 
enjoy your dog and you have a chance to be successful. So that's first and foremost. You gotta use space. If you watch a bunch of our videos, you'll see us use space a lot and you'll see how, how it works to actually relieve that tension from the dog and help him be successful. Um, and then as far as like, and I was gonna say like over time, you can also close the gap on that, right? So we're talking about using space, but as your dog gets better and better, you'll be able to close that gap and, and hopefully if everything goes smooth, be able to like eventually be much closer to the dogs without problems. So just wanted to make sure I got that in. Then um, as far as like what to do about like when, when approaching dogs or people and getting whining and stuff like that, I kind of do a combination, like me, Britt, Laura, Tony, I think we all do a combination. For one, we're all on e-collar, right? So we already have an advantage. And and if you're really determined to make even more progress, e-collar would probably be a game changer for you as far as like getting that reactivity and correcting the whining stuff under control. Um, the prong collar is awesome, but it can have some limitations. So that's one thing to think about. Um, but like, I'll really judge it on the dog itself. So if I'm out walking <clears throat> and the dog, I mean, I do a lot of like pulling the dog off to the side and putting him into a sit and then correcting for whining, staring, reacting, escalating, things like that. But once again, I'm using an e-collar, which really de-escalates dogs better than prong collars. So that method may or may not be fruitful for you. Um, you may need more space and then you could try and do that, try and put him in a sit. Um, if it's really too much for him, you can always turn him around. Um, and then for some dogs, it's just better to keep moving, you keep traveling by them, and they have less time to load and be anxious about it. So I typically will stop the dog, correct the dog, and get the dog to relax in the presence of the other dog. But sometimes you have to augment that if the other, if, 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 the stationary stuff doesn't work for your dog if the stationary stuff makes them escalate and lift off. So I, what I would say is I would do space and then I would start to get really cautious or really, really aware about what's helping your dog to be successful in those contexts. How is he looking more relaxed? How is he doing better? But I would definitely be correcting the whining. I'd definitely be correcting any of the escalation, but I'd be correcting like the staring first before the whining. The first look that dog gives at another dog or person pop, come back to me, be present with me, don't be staring at dogs, don't be staring at people because you don't know how to do it comfortably, it just makes you upset, so I don't want you upset, so that would be the approach that I would go with. And then just put all those pieces together, stay the course, watch more of our videos, and like I said, if you really want to step up um, e-collar stuff, you know, we don't deal with reactivity stuff without e-collar just because it's it's so much harder. So not that there can't be amazing progress made, but just want to throw that out there as, as an option for you guys. So hope that helps. Ow. Cool. All right. Yeah, you ready? Oh. Uh, I need 911. <laughs> no, okay. I'm going to survive. All right. Go ahead. Okay, question number two. This comes yeah. from Ellen Stone. Yeah. Ellen says, hey, I got one for you. I have an almost four-year-old lab hound mix who's a sweet, sensitive giant weighing in at over 100 pounds. He's pretty well-behaved except for during transitions. Like in the morning, I enjoy coffee and writing time in bed, and he lays with a foot, happily passed out. The second I put down my pen, then he's off the bed like a shot, whining and generally being a brat wanting to go outside. I don't think it's because he has to pee. Different times of the day get me the same reaction. Same thing when it's time to go for the walk. He gets pushy about going to the door. He'll wait while I open it and walk through first, but he's intensely excited and whiny until I tell him. Um, he's pretty chill otherwise. So what do I do about these transitions? P.S. I've loved the pictures, especially at the T3 event. Looks like you guys had a good one. Awesome. All right, this is uh, Ellen, right? Mm-hmm. Ellen. Ellen. Um, so is, is Ellen saying she's coming to T3? Is that what you said? I think she's just saying she. it looked fun. I don't oh, think she's going. Well, maybe someday, Ellen. Maybe someday maybe. we'll see. Maybe. So, uh, like, here's the dealio, right? Dogs are, like, the master phenomenal, amazing, great anticipators and readers of all subtle signs of behavior that yeah. might that might indicate something that they want to do. <laughs> I mean, we've all seen it. It's 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 amazing. Like one motion that you think has nothing to do with creating a, a signal or a cue, and the dog's like, I know what you're doing. 
And uh, so that's, it's always challenging just because they're so good at it. So um, to be honest, like the only thing I've found that that's, that's helpful for this stuff is for one to correct like an escalated state of mind, <coughs> excuse me, is to correct like a super aroused escalated state of mind. Like you can't like, that can really get much progress if you just let the dog just kind of like be amped up. And then second would be the dog only gets what it wants, like whatever it is, like through massive patience through like, and this is the, this is kind of the hard part of training stuff. It's like, after you've corrected, if the dog still is like not in the perfect space, you got to wait him out before you're going to reward him or else you're just rewarding and reinforcing that. So whether it's getting out the door or food or anything like that, you got to be really cautious about like your timing on that. So I, I would just, <clears throat> if it's, if it's an important one for you, if you really want to kind of nail it down, your dog's doing so great in so many contexts, then I would correct the nuttiness either with a prong collar or an e-collar if you're using one. And then, excuse me, and then, excuse me, again. And then, uh, where was I going? Um, and then uh, ask for a lot of patience and really try and kind of switch that around and even shake your schedule up. Like, I don't walk my dogs at the same time every day and I don't feed them at the same time every day just to make sure that they're not like, is it time? Is it time? Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that like Manny especially <clears throat> doesn't still struggle with like feeding times and doesn't still struggle with like going out the front door because he gets, he just, you know, he just, that's kind of who he is. He gets amped up. So I correct him just like I said, and then I make him wait before his leash goes on, before the food comes out. And so we just try and make incremental progress. Um, and it's kind of the reality of the situation. But one of the, the, the other realities of the situation is that, some of this stuff I don't know if you'll ever fix. Like, let's just call a spade a spade. Some of this stuff, like dogs are just dogs, and they live with us, and they figure us out, and they know what our routines are, and what our schedules are. And I, I honestly believe that, like, even, like, the greatest training in the world with certain things is just limitations, and you're going to get some nuttiness, and you're going to get some dog stuff. Yeah. And at some points, we just kind of have to say, like, chalk it up to, like, it's dog stuff. And you can always work to make it a little bit better, but don't like lose your mind in the process. Um, always remember that there's some just there's some imperfections and doggy kind of like neurotic or silly or whatever you know learned behaviors going on, and and just try and do your best with them, and don't bang your head against the wall just because like I've got my guy Manny who I'm you know pretty firm with, and uh, but he's so deeply ingrained from prior to when he got to me like to be like a maniac around food that we have to work at it all the time. So hopefully, hopefully that helps you guys. Oh, look at you. What do you mean? Look at me. what I do? You make these faster. I think you're making faster when it's this format. Yeah. I'm trying to get a little less long in the tooth, a little less jabber jaws. Yeah. I, I think I get, you know me, if anybody knows me, you know me. I'll say oh. it five, I'll say it five different times. Right? I, there's no, there's no, I'm just, it's just an observation. That's it. <laughs> All right. Question number three. This comes from Emily Heilbron, who we're going to meet at T3. Oh, cool. Um, I think. Okay. I think so. Hi again. Can't wait for your book, not to mention T3 in Florida. Question, working on higher level corrections for even a low whiff of a growl when someone comes to the door. He still gets that intense look after he's been corrected for growling. Should I correct this even after he stops growling? Thank you, Emily. Emily. <clears throat> well, we'll be excited to see you at T3 if you make it. That would be super awesome. I think she's talking about Florida, which would be a blast. So, um, I think she signed up for another one, but I think I'm probably wrong. Yeah. I think I think she said Florida in her message. Yeah. But um, anyways, so uh, if you don't join us, then hopefully we'll see you at some other point. Um, so it sounds like the higher level corrections that you're using, if you're, if you're correcting for like people coming in the house and your dog's growling or being in a negative state and you're correcting and he's moving out of the growl, but he's staying locked in an intense place, 
to me, that just sounds like it's hard to say 100% without seeing, but I'd venture to guess pretty strongly that that correction isn't enough for a state change. It's enough to kind of like block escalation. It's enough to get him to stop growling. But like a state change is really like, state change kind of looks like to, right? So state change, I don't have ears, but if it was like ears, it would be like that kind of intensity and then forehead wrinkle and then you correct and the dog goes, relaxes. You should see a fairly dramatic state change in the dog. If you don't do it, my suspicion is your, your levels are just too low and you might feel like you're high, but you might be surprised that for your dog and in that context with how it, how it stimulates them and arouses them and gets them upset that it's not nearly enough level. Yeah. So, so I'd start out of the gate correcting firm, more firmly than you are right now with a vision towards, I want a state change. I want to see like, I'm perfectly okay with some mild avoidance right now, right? So don't be in a state where you're like, wow, I corrected him and now he like turns away, doesn't want to look. Avoidance is the first step towards acceptance. So we're totally okay with that. And you have to make sure that the conversation is powerful enough for the dog to actually move into that space. So I would definitely be looking for firmer corrections out of the gate. And then <clears throat> if you get any residual stuff after that correction, which once again tells me I don't think the first one was strong enough, then raise it up for the second one when the state of mind is a little bit lessened and really let them know like, hey, but knock that crap off. So try and nail it in the first one. <clears throat> if you don't get it completely where you want, the dog still has some intensity, roll up, repeat, no, pop, and you should see a de-escalation. If you hit the right level, you should absolutely see it. So, um, Laura, anything to add to that little? No, I mean, you covered it. It's a good one. It's a good yeah. question. It is a good question. It's one of those feel things, and like, if you haven't done a ton of work with e-collar, it can be really hard to discern what's, I think there's a lot of concern and fear about, about fallout, about what's healthy and what's not healthy. And if you go too high, you might damage the dog, you might create associations or, or uh, uh, superstitions or things that you don't want. But if you've conditioned the dog properly, you've got tons of latitude with like higher corrections with the dog going, hey man, it's my fault. I know why I got the correction because I was doing something stupid. So that's, that's where I'd go with that. And then report back and let us know how it goes. And it's just to be clear, it's not always about like higher corrections, higher corrections. I know you hear us talk a lot about that stuff here, but most of the stuff we do is about foundational work at very low levels. But when you have a dog that's stuck in a state like that, I'm absolutely comfortable with going for higher levels to break that state. And then your job is to find out how do I really get him out of that. That's kind of it. So hope that helps. Yay. Yay. Okay. All right, question four. This is from Heather Leah Gardy. Heather says, um, I have five bratty pups. My fault, but I was wondering what's the best way to train them one at a time. And um, if so, should the other be present? Well, like a gate up so they can't get close or in the other house or me outdoors with one thing. Man, I love that snare drum sound. Every time it comes on, I'm like, man. For you, guys, for you aficionados out there, the 1927 Levy Brass snare drum. 1927. That's old stuff. Um, that's why it sounds so magical. Anywho, so uh, five dogs, best way to train them. Don't do them all together. Right, that's the worst thing in the world. Don't do them all together. It'll be a circus. It'll be a zoo and a circus and a zoo that you don't want to visit. One that you want to like take the tram and get away from. So um, <clears throat> basically whenever we work with dogs, whenever we've got dogs that come in, even if like, you know, siblings come in, anything like that, we always work them independently. Dogs can't learn with a bunch of chaos and a bunch of distractions going on. You're just not going to get what you're looking for, especially like family dynamics where dogs are like tense around each other or being bratty and like triggering each other. So <clears throat> one dog at a time, <clears throat> excuse me, one dog at a time, and then definitely remove the other dogs. I don't, I wouldn't want those other dogs like peering through, sorry about that, peering through like a baby gate or whining or making noise. All of that's distraction. 
all of it's going to make it harder for your dog to do well. So my big suggestion is it takes a long time, but you pick five dogs, right? So it takes a long time. So let's train them one at a time. Uh, you don't need to do 10 hours a day. Do half an hour a day with each dog. Start to make some progress. And when they're when they're ready, when their state of mind is better, when they're more balanced and, and stable, then you can start putting them together and you can start having them work around each other, which is exactly what we do. We start incorporating dogs and more distractions and things like that. But initially, keep it quiet, keep it simple, keep it easy so the dogs can learn and um, put the other suckers away and you'll, you'll figure it out. Just nice, simple logic of like making it simple, making it easy. I think you'll, I think you'll do just fine. Definitely one at a time. Definitely. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Question number five. This comes from Oleg Vosgresensky. Uh, hi, Sean and Laura. I have a question for you regarding dog socialization. My dog, yeah. an old female pit mix, doesn't react to other, does not react to other dogs when we go for a walk. She can walk by a dog lunging on leash and totally ignore him. Oh, sorry. Uh. Thanks to e training. Um, when she actually meets another dog, though, uh, she doesn't always go so well. She's fine with super calm or submissive dogs, but otherwise she always always reacts badly to meeting another dog. If I don't have a lot of balanced dogs nearby, how do I practice good socialization with her? Or am I setting the bar too high for her, giving her that she has re zero reactivity issues on leash? Any insight you can both provide would be wonderful. Many thanks to what you guys do. Oh, Oleg, so nice. Yeah. Is it, isn't Oleg from Denmark? Uh, I don't know. I don't know where he's from. I think Oleg's from Denmark because I think we were in Texas and I think I was talking to him about, you know, my experience being in Denmark. And yeah. 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 Pretty sure. So, um, <clears throat> um, so first of all, like, major congrats on, on making all the progress with the reactivity stuff and using the e-collar, like, yeah. big time congrats. And I don't even know, are you, I don't know, you don't have to disclose it if you don't want to, but I'm, I'm curious, are, are you allowed to use e-collars in Denmark or not? I know Norway's not, right? No, Laura. No, no. Yeah, I wonder what I wonder what the story is in Denmark. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, even if you're covertly doing it, I know a lot of people around Europe that are covertly training just because it's the best tools for their dogs. So um, whichever the whichever the case is, awesome work that you've got your dog in a better space. Like it's a testament to that the tools work. So like, unfortunately, if it is illegal, it's really unfortunate that people have to struggle and suffer uh, needlessly. So <clears throat> as for your dog, I personally wouldn't put her, you know, in uncomfortable spaces like this. I would really honor what, what she's giving you, which is one, she's giving you fantastic behavior around other dogs, really, really nice stuff. But then you say that like, you say in certain contexts, like, She's great with submissive, sweet, sensitive dogs, and she's not great with pushy, more exuberant dogs, right? So basically, she just said, like, hey, you know I mean? Like, think about it from a human standpoint. She just said, like, hey, I'm a sensitive girl, and I don't like to go to, like, loud, noisy parties. I'd rather go to, like, a coffee shop and talk to, talk to a couple friends, and that feels good to her. Going to the loud, noisy party is uncomfortable, intense, and anxiety-inducing. So it's kind of a weird analogy, but it like it's really true. Like your dog has told you, I can do well in certain contexts, but I can't do well in others. And to push to say like you need to be okay with other dogs when she's obviously sensitive, and then saying I need you to be good with not sensitive dogs, I think I think it is setting the bar too high. Um, I'm not a big like to be honest. I put very little emphasis and effort into saying like all these dogs need to have like dog friends and be socialized constantly. I just, I don't find it to be nearly as valuable as I think a lot of other people do. I find that getting your dog into a good space individually with you within your singular pack and getting great behavior and great relationship, that's 90% of the game. And if you can have some dog friends that are really polite and cool and, and healthy, awesome. But your dog's not going to, to, to suffer or struggle or not reach its ultimate uh, its ultimate dogdom 
if it doesn't have a million different friends and learn to tolerate them all, right? So this kind of goes back to us setting standards of like, I need my dog to be able to do this and this, and why can't she be around like these dogs? It's like, it's very simple. Like either she had something happen to her early on that made her sensitive, or she's just highly sensitive and those kind of dogs just don't float her boat. So honor that in her, cherish that she's doing so great, celebrate that she's rocking things like nobody's business, and then pick some good select, nice, awesome friends for her to hang out with. Yeah. And you're good, you're going. You don't, you don't need to sweat any of that other stuff. I won't put my dogs around nasty, like pushy dogs. Not in that way, no how. Cool. Cool. Whoa. Soapbox. Soapbox time. All right. Question number six. It comes from our girl Tara Isaacson. Tara, yeah. says, hi guys. Can you walk us through logistics and prep for flying with a dog? What size travel crate? Where do you drop off and pick up? Do you recommend training visits to the airport? Sometimes I see people walking through the airport, sometimes leaving them a baggage check. I know you guys do this a lot, so any tips would be appreciated. And as you see, it says, have the lovely Laura Morgan answer this one. Me. That's yeah. you. But, but it's like, she's asking more. And the reason I actually put you up to this is because I know you fly with Cujo. Um, but more importantly, like when we were having a lot of clients fly dogs in from yeah. like out of, you and Sean Zavitsky kind of like coordinated that. I was curious yeah. if you just happen to remember any of the details involved with that. Yeah. Okay. So. From my experience flying with, with Cujo and then my experience working with clients that sent us dogs, so we've got what size travel crate? So a travel crate should probably be a similar size to the crate that you're using right now, you know, enough for them to stand up and turn around. Um, you, each airline has specifics on their website of what you're supposed to do. So I think like the one that I was using a lot was, I want to say Delta. I think it was Delta. And Delta had specifics. And they, you have to have like a water dish in there that attaches to the crate, um, to the travel crate. Um, I think the dog has to be able to stand up to stretch his legs and turn around. And then you can put like a mat or whatever in there. But it definitely needs a water dish. Um, I so think... Oh, um, you can probably go online and get all that info, right? Yeah, you just check the airline that you're working with. Um, where do you drop off and pick up? So I think it depends, again, with the airline. They're going to let you know. I think a lot of dogs get dropped off like where you drop off your bags um, and you put them in the travel crate and all that stuff and pay and then you drop it off and then they do a special run with the dog. Um, and then the pickup depends. So... The pickup sometimes is like in the same area as baggage claim. They have like dogs, they have like special delivery for dogs. Um, but I think also like the way that we did it because the dogs were being flown without an owner on the same plane, they flew and they were like in the cargo and then we had to go to like the cargo at LAX, yeah. like the cargo with a whole different building. Um, but that was because the dogs didn't, didn't have an owner that they were flying with. So they weren't, they were shipped or driven over to this cargo section. So that um, that's going to be specific on the airline, but I think it's typically if you're flying with a dog at the baggage claim, both, both places, do you recommend training visits to the airport? Um, I mean, yeah, because there's different things, right? So there's like escalators, elevators, um, people around, rolling bags, other dogs, um, sounds they've never heard before, stuff like that. You could probably get away with like going to a mall, a, a dog friendly mall and taking your dog through that and kind of seeing how, I, I guess you're maybe talking about Scout, um, seeing how Scout does in that, in that sort of like crowded environment with lots of sounds and noise and different stuff going on and escalators and things that you have to do, you know. But if you're just dropping her off at like baggage claim where where the dogs get um, picked up there, it's not too bad. I wouldn't I wouldn't be too worried about it. Um, but yeah, that's the best I can do. Does that help? 
I think that should help. I think that should help. I mean, just always check it out with each, with, with each airline and make sure you've yeah. got ins and outs. But, uh, yeah, I think you covered some good deets. Cool. All right. Yeah. So we've got our next question. I've lost track of what the questions are. Seven? Seven? Okay. Seven is Jamie. And Jamie says, um, I haven't been on here for a while. One of my dogs had a spinal injury. Didn't want to think. Didn't want you to think we stopped following you. Not a question, but an update. I found out a plastic crate makes a huge difference for Yuri. I think that's her dog versus the open wire crate. Also, reactivity is lessened. An excitable dog rushed up to her face. Not a great owner, and she kept her composure. E collar on, but didn't have to use it. I hope you are both doing well. I will be back soon. Uh, yeah. that's awesome yeah 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 so Jamie so we haven't heard from Jamie in a while but she's yeah. a regular <clears throat> so sorry about first of all sorry about your dog with the spinal injury I hope he's okay yeah, yeah. that sounds terrible um, hopefully it's nothing permanent and you're just kind of getting them all healed up um, and then as far as plastic crates go like I've definitely heard stuff you know we don't use them very often um, if at all <clears throat> But I've definitely heard for like major separation anxiety that yeah. plastic, plastic crates can afford a, a little bit of a different experience for the dog, but then also kind of a weird one. Um, this comes from uh, Mark Goldberg, who's like old school trainer guy. And um, he puts hay, he fills half the crate with hay. And <clears throat> the plastic crate filled halfway with hay tends according to him and, and others to create some really nice like comfort and relaxation in, in a lot of separation anxiety dogs. So that's something that you could always try if you're willing to get like hay and get your place a little dirty like a like a horse stall. So um, but but yeah definitely have heard about heard about excuse me heard about plastic crates having some effects uh, positive effects for certain dogs. I think it's a super individual thing. We've never had a dog like that that's come through that we haven't been able to work through with a wire crate, so that we haven't really found the the, ne the necessity to do that. But there could always be the first one, and so it's always good to have that in your mind of like options that you can jump into. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's it. Um, let me see. <clears throat> oh, and then um, awesome about the uh, reactivity stuff. Yeah, right. That's our name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that's with Yuri. That's like badass. So Yuri was kind of a loose cannon, and the fact that like Yuri just had like a dog come like poof, right up in his grill and was like, yeah. Dude, "I got this. You don't need to hassle me." Pretty cool stuff. So awesome, awesome. Thanks for the thanks for the check in. Hope your other dog heals up, and hope we will see you more regularly. Regularly. Yeah. All right. Thank All right. You. Question number eight. This comes from Jose. Jose says, why don't you use food in your training? No way, Jose. Jose, we do use food. I just wanted to say that. Oh, you're... For us, <laughs> For us oh, mainly. <laughs> that's a Tony, T-Money. That's yeah. a T-Money. No way, Jose. Uh, no way, Jose. So, uh, good question, man. Really, actually, a good question. And... Um, so, <clears throat> food stuff's a really interesting thing. Um, we do use it for certain situations. We use it for, um, if we've got a highly human aggressive dog that comes in, always use food for that. Um, dogs only eat out of our hands and they're muzzled and that's really the bridge we use to build a relationship from I want to eat you to I want to eat what you've got in your hand. So that always transpires <clears throat> for, for heavily dog, for heavily human aggressive dogs. So we definitely use food for that. And then highly unmotivated dogs, like real stick in the muds dogs that are like working at all, like really bums me out. Those will be dogs that we'll tend to use food with. Um, to try and help balance them out and keep them in a good space. But personally, like, I wrote some notes just to make sure I didn't forget all of them. But um, I just, I'm not down with, like, the amped up, um, always on edge, waiting for a command and, like, payday mindset that you see with a lot of dogs. Like, that amped up quality, that, like, 
waiting. Are you going to call me? Are you going to call me? Are you going to call me? Are you going to pay me? You know, like what's next? It's just not a way that I'm looking to live with dogs <clears throat> personally. So a lot of this is a real personal choice. I'm, I'm really interested in more laid back, chilled out, relaxed dogs. And so when I see, I see, you know, it's, it's a real kind of like, it's a real discrepancy or, or dis disagreement, whatever you want to call it in the dog training world that people not using food and more positive reinforcement to create like happy dogs. Um, there's a lot of resistance to that. And, and I get it. I, I get that like happy dogs are great marketing and happy dogs make, you know, uh, a lot of owners feel good. But I also know because we do like primarily behavior mod that that excitement that edginess, that amped up quality can be very, very, very counterproductive and can really hinder your progress with the dog. And so we're always looking for calm stuff. Honestly, in my opinion, like getting excitement, getting like fun, getting exuberance, getting a, jo a dog to go bananas, that's easy. Like get your owner out in the backyard and like find his favorite toy and like go bananas. Like that, that stuff's always on tap. But getting a dog to be able to like be calm, relaxed, chilled out to really condition them like that. Um, not just say like, I'm going to train you on e collar to do stuff, but to condition a dog to be in a more lower gear, more relaxed. Um, we've just found to be highly, highly valuable to creating the uh, end result that we're looking for, which is a calm, chilled out dog. I've just, I've never had an owner come in and be like, I need my dog more excited. I need my dog to be more on edge. I need him staring at me. Um, and I'm being a little silly with that, but like, it's a real personal call. And I know a lot of great tra dog trainers that I highly respect that use tons and tons of food. And that's great for them if that feels good and feels solid about like, and when I say product, I mean like the dog product they're putting out. And it's just not where, where we're at. As, as a team, we all feel the same about <clears throat> wanting to use food very carefully. We're, we're not big fans of amped up dogs we're not big fans of dogs waiting around like what's next i don't live with my dogs like that i don't want my dogs like that like if i call them they should come um they don't have to like create a bolt of lightning to come but they should come and otherwise they should be relaxed and chilled out which is like exactly like if i can pan over i don't know if you guys can see it but can you see a little bit laura right those are my those are my guys right they're not sitting there waiting for their next payday. They're just chilling, and that's how we live. So I train dogs in the same way that I want to live with dogs, and hopefully that's a Cujo, right? Ooh. He's like, where's my next chicken breast? Um, so, 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 yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a personal call, and like I said, it's nothing wrong with people that use food. Just personally, we're not into it, and we don't like the effects from it. And so we're looking for calm, chilled out, relaxed dogs. And so that's what we create. And uh, hopefully that answers your question, buddy. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. What? Question number cool. nine. This is from question number nine is from Chelsea. Chelsea says, I'm training a dog to recall with an e-collar. I've tried this many times and use pressure on, pressure off, and pair it with come. The dog is getting the command well, but not making the connection with the collar. His working level is six. I also correct him for tail chasing, circling on a level 16, which works well. Should I increase the working level or maybe give stim and delay come? Thanks, guys. Go ahead. I could just listen to it all day. Okay. So Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea. Um, this is an interesting one. Man, what I wouldn't give to see a like 30 second video of what's going on with you. Um, <clears throat> I know I can't do that, so I'm just gonna have to take some stabs at it. Um, I'd go back to basics. I do very short recalls. Um, I get the dog on a six foot leash, and here's what I would do, and here's what I wouldn't do. I would do exactly, I don't know if you've seen my e-collar videos for like recall, <clears throat> but when I start with recall, <clears throat> I don't give any command, sleepy Laura. I don't give it, you guys can't see it. Um, I don't give any command for, um, for, for recall straight away. And what I do is dogs out in front of me, pressure on that I know that the dog cares about but isn't worried about. 
gentle leash guidance, like really gentle. As soon as the dog's head turns toward, towards me, excuse me, the button goes off, call the dog in, good boy, good boy, good boy, and do that over and over again. And basically what that does is it conditions the dog that when I feel the stem, I turn my head. Now, you've used the e-collar for different stuff like tail chasing and things like that, and you might have gotten into that and I, I could be totally wrong, but you might have gotten into that out of out of sequence as far as like correcting the dog for stuff before you conditioned him to what the e-collar meant in a more general kind of universal sense. And that could be a problem where the dog's like, yeah, it stops me from chasing my tail at 15, but what I've learned is that it means I'm doing something wrong and so I just stop and I don't know what to do. And so then when you go to use the e-collar for recall, the dog's stuck. And he's like, ah, crap, I don't know what to do with this thing. So that may or may not be the case, but it sounds like it is. And so what I would do, and uh, if I was there, I'd put my finger like right there in his mouth as she's yawning like that. You guys they can't can see, see me, so it sounds, they don't just, get it. It's my own story. It's all right. They can, they can roll with me. Uh, can, you turn up, can you put the brightness up on your screen? Because you're really getting dark. Uh, how do I do that? Never make that sound again. Um, it's the top. No, don't. It's loud. It's really loud. They're going to hate okay. you. The okay. top top left on your keyboard, you see these little, sorry, guys, we need a little break. Oh, you yeah. Little suns. Do the oh. sun to the right. I did. I think we're all the way bright. Really? Okay. It's getting dark here, lady. It's 6.15, so right we're now. I think that's what's going on. So it's just going to be the dark, sultry side of Sean. They'll have to just kind of a little bit. So <clears throat> where was I before um, before that? Um, oh, it's just the chasing tail and he stops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my suspicion is that the dog maybe didn't get conditioned enough to the e-collar. I could be wrong. And now he's not sure. Now he's concerned. Now he's worried. Now he's confused. But a really easy way to fix that is like what I just said. Six foot leash on, dog wanders away from you, <clears throat> button on, gentlest of leash pressure just to whisper to the dog what you want him to do with it. Dog turns his head, giving into the pressure of the leash and the e collar, button goes away, good boy, good boy, good boy. Do that over and over and over and over again so you know that when the dog feels it, turn, feels it, turn, feels it, turn. And when that's rock solid, then add your command back in. And then that should give you some pretty good certainty about how the dog's doing the things. And he should be pretty solid with that. I've never heard of a dog not being able to like getting it with food or treats or something like that. But then like, I don't get it with e-collar. The only way that would happen is if it hasn't been communicated clearly. And I know you said you've trained a lot of dogs with that, but maybe because of his particular thing of chase tailing and correcting for that, maybe something got wonky with that. So that'd be my suggestion. Go back to basics, start slow, no command. A little pressure, a little e collar, and see if you can't teach him to turn his head when he feels it. Oh, wow. Fast. Just lost the. Um... Okay. You ready? Question number 10. It's from Irene. Irene says Hi, Sean and Laura. I've had this foster ch chihuahua for a year now, and I've made great strides as far as basic obedience and place command is good. But I don't get why he's still marking in the house. I washed all my bedding the other day, made the bed up, and at some point he peed on the bed. He marks in every room of the house. How can I stop this short of keeping him crated 24 7? I'm frustrated. Thanks. That is frustrating. What did you say, Irene? He dads. You are a better woman than me. I think me and that Chihuahua would have a very long talk on a very long drive out to the uh, <laughs> you know, talking about the desert, uh, out to the prairie or where, wherever it is, out to the ranch. Um, that's a that's a really hard one. I can't tell you why the dog's doing it. I don't know what's going on. Most likely, it's just bad habits that have been allowed to transpire, which is probably why he's you know been returned and is in foster care now. Um, any dog who's like walking around and marking on stuff like that has absolutely been allowed to engage in bad habits and hasn't been corrected for it. And so that's just kind of what's going on. He may also be a little dominant, little SOB, and maybe that's cooking as well. Um, but it's impossible to say. I wouldn't give that little dude any freedom. <clears throat> if like I could not fathom having a dog peeing around my house or on my bed, like 
it, it, it would be him or me, we'd be, in, we'd be in big trouble. And, um, so that, that's, that's a real like serious issue in lifestyle. Like, you know, this is something that will get a dog killed because, and I know that sounds dramatic, but like no one's going to adopt a dog that's going to mark all over the house. It's just simple. They're just, no one wants to live like that. So, um, for one, I wouldn't give him freedom, um, until he can, uh, until he's changed, until he's on a, on on the on the good foot, um, that means either he's tied to you as as a as a uh, tether, or he's in the crate, or he's in place, and he's not moving his his butt or behind at all. And then on top of that, I would train that little sucker on e collar, and just you can do whatever you want. You don't have to do a lot of stuff. Spend. 30 minutes teaching that little sucker recall or sit or whatever, getting him comfortable with the, what the e-collar stem means. And then I'd let that guy go to town. Here, drink a gallon of water, and then I'm going to hide out. I'm going to watch, and I'm going to make you dance. And I know that sounds really horrible, and I know it makes me sound like a terrible man, terrible dog trainer, but like that will get that dog killed. That dog that's urinating all over the house, no one wants to adopt that dog. Yeah. And so – that dog probably hasn't had a conversation about that's that he's that's been connected to his marking that's been uh powerful enough for him to say like you know what i'm gonna haul my gear in and maybe take it outside so i would say e-collar on that guy a little mini educator and um and then just set him up watch him baby cam whatever you've got any kind of camera system wait outside the, the window might take you a while to catch him but boy, would I correct his behind super, super intense and say, you better think real, real long and hard about peeing anywhere in my house. Because the reality is, it's like right now it's rewarding. Just think about it clearly, simply easy. It's rewarding. I get up on the bed, feels good to mark. This is my space. This is my thing. I've been doing it forever. <clears throat> or I get up on the bed and holy bananas, the bed catches on fire. Ah, do I want to pee on it anymore? No, I want to do something else. So maybe I'll behave myself, be a civilized gentleman, and go pee outside like, like normal dogs do. So I sound rough and tough and harsh, but like uh, I, I don't dig what the dog's doing. I think it's crappy behavior, and I also know that that crappy behavior will end up getting the dog killed because nobody, except for like somebody with like all plastic furniture, would ever put up with that. So, um, so that's kind of my like hard ass answer. But I think if you were to go down that road and, and catch him a couple of times and really like light him up good for doing that stuff, I think you'd find him making some very, very different choices. The first time you correct him. He might just pee anyways, just out of like, oh, but <clears throat> you'll, you'll work him through it to where he won't do it anymore. That'd be my suggestion. Sorry to get tough, rough, and hard and heavy, but that's sometimes what you got to do. Sometimes you just got to get tough, rough, and heavy. You do. You do. You do. So okay. I, think, I think that's the end of the line there, Laura Morgan. There is. Thank you. you we made you this were quiet. again. You were kind of quiet this time. You know what's so funny? Like, I'm still recovering from the sickness a little bit where I'm just not able to sleep through the night. So I'm exhausted right now. I might yeah. take a nap. <laughs> I'm not joking. Grandma Morgan? Grandma Morgan might just I'm like not, up. I'm not a nap person, but I feel so tired. Oh, I, I, I hear you. Like I said, we're both struggling with this, but I think you're getting way the way heavier end of it. I, I mean, I'm done with it. I'm I'm definitely better than I was the other day, but man, I'm just exhausted. Yeah, Physical but you look good. Really exhausted. You, look, you don't look like beat up, or yeah, yeah, you don't look like beat up or anything like that. So that's great. Oh. You look like you're fighting, fighting through. Oh. Did wow. you show everybody? Did you show everybody your pretty nails? New nails, guys. Cool. I like that color. I like it. Like it. Like it. Cool. I love it. I love What's nails. That? It's so I fun. No. It's so good that it managed to be like your big breakthrough of like not biting them anymore and yeah. then turn it full fashion statement just up your up your totally. profile That's by a thousand. Cool. Oh, all right. All right. All right. Sleeping beauty. Go do your thing. 
let's uh, do a little dance to get these folks out and then we'll say goodbye and the next time they see us, we'll be together in New Orleans. Yeah, what, what's today, Friday? Yep. And so you're flying in Sunday, man, it's like hop, skip and a jump. Right around the hop, corner. Yeah. I'll have to get your bike all like, get your tires filled up, get you all revved up so you're ready to like, go like race some hell. Oh, can't wait, awesome. All right. All right, cool. All right. Let's, let's, let's make a dance sequence. Sure. What? Oh, look at you. Oh. See it, Sean. Do it again. Nice. I like it. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Love you. Thanks for watching. Bye. Talk to you soon.